Thank you, and thank you so much for being here. Um, anyone from New York City? New York City, anyone? No? Yes, so before I take you into the future of energy and transportation, I wanna take you into the past. Um, this is New York City, 1900. Uh, we used horses as our main means of transportation for thousands of years. There is one car in this picture, one car. Can anyone see it? One car, there. Um, 1900 New York, Fifth Avenue. 1913, in a sea of cars, can anyone see the one horse in that picture? One horse. So New York went from all car, all horse to all cars in 13 years. That's a disruption. And this happened more than a century ago. So what is a disruption? Uh, just to explain it, it's when technologies converge and make it possible for companies and entrepreneurs to create new products that do two things. One is um, they create a new market and they also um, either at the moment or later help to destroy or radically transform an existing industry. That's what a disruption is. So think digital cameras, what they did to film, that is a destruction. Uh, or think what Uber and so on, DD, are doing to, trans to taxis, and that's a radical transformation. Both are different forms of disruption. Um, so let me give you another example, 1985, uh, one of my favorite case studies. Uh, the then largest company, telecom company in the world, AT&T, hired McKinsey, and they had this thing, this cell phone thing, um, and they asked McKinsey for a 15-year prediction. They asked them, this, you know, one kilo, two dollar a minute thing, what's going to be the adoption in about 15 years, so uh, in the year 2000? McKinsey went off and did whatever it is that they do, um, and they came back with the number 900,000. 900,000. In 15 years, there's going to be 900,000 users of the cell phone. The actual number was 109 million. That's not a small mistake. That's a factor of 120 times, which shows you that the smartest people are not the ones who get disruption. But also, when you dismiss disruption, disruptive opportunities, you also miss out on wealth creation opportunities. I mean, if you look on your right, just seven of the largest internet and slash telecom company in the world, that's a $3 trillion market valuation. $3 trillion that, you know, AT&T could have grabbed a good piece of that, but they didn't because A, they got disrupted, and two, they dismissed disruptive opportunities. And it's usually the experts and the insiders and the mainstream analysts who dismiss disruptive opportunities. And usually it goes like this. It can't possibly happen, or it can't possibly happen that quickly for whatever reason, right? We love this or we love that. We love the records. Uh, why would we want to give up on our... DVDs or whatever. So a lot of my work over the last dozen years has been to answer this question. Why do smart people and smart organizations consistently um, fail to anticipate disruption, let alone lead the disruption? You have to first anticipate it. Um, so I've been working on a disruption framework, technology disruption framework, not only to understand past disruptions, which is interesting but not very useful, um, but also to anticipate. Can we anticipate future disruptions? So uh, after a lot of work on this, let me show you a few of the boxes in that, um, in that framework. So one of the things that I look at is technology cost curves. So a lot of technologies have basically improvements in cost uh, I mean, in performance for the same cost every year. So computing is one of them. So Moore's law says that every two years or so, um, computing improves by 2x. And that's basically 40 plus percent every year. 
and it's been doing that for decades and decades. Uh, and when you compound that, then it gets very, um, basically 1000X every 20 years. So the power in your $600 phone you would have cost $600,000 20 years ago, 600 million um, um, 40 years ago, and so on and so forth. But it's not just computing. I mean, a lot of technologies from solar PV, touch, uh, touch screen, um, uh, digital imaging, and so on and so forth, all of them have different technology cost curves. And it's not just disruptive technologies, but it's the convergence of technologies that enables disruption. So if you ask yourself, for instance, uh, solar PV, for instance, has improved by about 11.4% every year since 1970. So it's improved by about 300 times on a per unit basis since 1970. What do you think it's gonna do this year and next year and next year? Well, guess what? It keeps improving and every year, the experts say it can't possibly improve and guess what? It does, right? But it's the convergence, like I said, of technologies that enables disruptions. So um, the cell phone, for instance, if you think about your smartphone, the iPhone, um, the Android phone, both Google and Apple came up with a smartphone the same year, 2007. Why 2007, why not 2005 or 2009? Have you asked yourself? Because that was the year when the convergence of the technologies that made a $600 smartphone possible happened. So in 2007, anybody could have done a smartphone. Blackberry could have done it. Motorola could have done it, remember them? Nokia could have done it, remember them? But it wasn't them. It, and that's another lesson of disruption. Disruption happens from the outside. Neither Google nor Apple had ever built a phone before. Now they own that market. Um, so what do I follow today that I think are going to, that the key technologies that are essentially going to disrupt everything? Every uh, industry in the world is going to be disrupted one way or another over the next, oh, in the 2020s, by a different convergence of these technologies at different times, at different costs. Now, this is not at all the list, but these are the technologies that I follow. Blockchain, solar PV, batteries, um, uh, and so on and so forth. Now, um, one very important key point is this. Every single technology ever, or at least every single technology that I've studied all the way back to 1454, has been adopted as an S curve. Now, if they're successful, if they're not, then they die a quick death. But if they're successful, they're adopted as an S curve. What does that mean? Here's an example of color television adoption in the United States. CDS, essentially the key is to understand when that tipping point is going to happen. So you see the S at that tipping point, it accelerates exponentially to take 80% of the market and then it's over pretty much, right? Um, and yet mainstream analysts, and, and look at these S curves how they keep getting steeper and steeper and steeper, which means that technology adoption is happening faster and faster and faster in a matter of months or years, and then it's pretty much over. Now S-curves look a lot like J-curves. I mean, they go like boom, and it's over. Whoever was the incumbent, gone, right? Very, very quickly. And yet, what you see today still is linear mainstream analysts who give you lines. So, you know, look at the right. Solar PV adoption is the thick black line. Solar has grown by 40% per year since the year 2000, right? And yet every year the International Energy Agency gives us a flat line, right? So it's gonna go flat over the next to 2040. 
and then solar grows 40%, and then, okay, we'll go back to that, another line. And then solar grows 40%, okay, we'll go back and do another line, right? At which point are you going to understand that it's growing at 40% per year? And now that it's the cheapest form of energy in the desert, do you think it's going to be flat or do you think it's going to accelerate? In any case, the thing about them is, you know, they're linear, they're backwards looking, and they're siloed. They look at this one thing and not at all the forces, all the convergence of all technologies, right? That could potentially enable disruption. And also, they don't look at business model innovation, which can be every bit as disruptive as technology innovation, if not more. So how is business model innovation disruptive? Well, take a look at this little company called Uber. Uh, or any of their peers, Lyft or DD or, and so on. Um, Uber, I mean, ride hailing, is a business model innovation, not so much a technology innovation. I mean, they put together the smartphone infrastructure, the cloud infrastructure, and they intermediate it, actually using a very old model, right? They're a marketplace broker. Um, but that wasn't possible before. So it was the combination of the cloud and the smartphone that made that possible. And Uber, a company that was started in 2009, um, in 2016 generated more bookings than the whole taxi industry in America. Seven years. Whoever tells you that a disruption in transportation cannot happen in seven years, well, here's the evidence. They're not looking at the actual data. It's already been done, right? And there are others in other countries like DD that are even bigger. Um, and the transition from ownership to access is already underway. Last year, almost 10% of those who traded in their cars in America did not buy a new one almost 10%, that's not a small number. And that is at today's prices of ride hailing, today's prices. In San Francisco, 20% of all vehicle miles traveled are already ride hailing, Uber and Lyft, 20%. And that's only in seven years. Now, as a disruptor, my, as an entrepreneur, my question would be, how do you go from 20 to 100? What would happen if the cost of Uber and Lyft, or transportation goes down by 10x? That's the disruption. Now, let's put that together, which is what I did. And four years ago, I came up with a book called Clean Disruption of Energy and Transportation. And essentially, that book said that these four, uh, three technologies and one business model put together would essentially disrupt all of transportation within by 2030, essentially. So let me walk you through um, some of them. Batteries. So batteries, lithium ion batteries is an example. Uh, for about 15 years, they improved the cost curve was about 14% per year. 14% improvement every year. Um, and then from 2010 to 2014, it improved to 16% per year. Now I published my book in 2014, and I'll show you what a cost curve would look like if you extrapolate at 16%, which is exactly what I published four years ago. Now, in the media, in the mainstream analyst uh, 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 media, they will tell you there is a magic number, 100 or whatever it is, at which EVs become disruptive, for instance, or batteries become disruptive. Not the case. Again, there are different convergences in different markets that makes basically disrupt different markets. So at 300, it disrupts peakers, for instance. At 200, it disrupts commercial. At 100, it disrupts residential and so on. So at different points, it may disrupt different markets. And um, as we probably know, the infrastructure being built for batteries has gone up in three years by six times six times over the last uh, basically three years. 
which means that that technology cost curve that was 16% is now 20%. So in fact, batteries are going down in cost by 20% per year. It accelerated, right? And folks said four years ago, it can't possibly go down by another 16%. Guess what? It didn't. It actually accelerated. It's going down by 20%. Um, and today in the United States, 25% of businesses could save money uh, by putting batteries behind the meter. Today, at today's prices, no subsidies. So at today's prices, lithium ion batteries are already disruptive in, commercial, in the commercial market. Um, so that's how power is, is being disrupted. And what you're finding is that a lot of companies are getting into uh, batteries. Dyson, Dyson, right? Um, vacuum cleaners. Uh, they're getting into batteries. They're investing 2.5 billion pounds to build a battery uh, infrastructure. And they say that they're going to have a car by 2020. An electric car, Dyson. Is it making cars difficult? I mean, don't you need like, you know, precision, manufacturing and so on? Well, guess what? Not really, but this is a clean disruption, right? I mean, if it happens, I mean, that is a clean disruption. In any case, what batteries are enabling is another disruption, the electric vehicle disruption. So I don't need to go into what an EV is or Tesla and whatnot, but the question is, are EVs disruptive or are they a green kind of sustainable commie conspiracy, right? Um, I'll give you a few reasons. Uh, why EVs are disruptive. One, um, once you buy an EV, charging it on a per mile basis is 10 times cheaper than fueling an internal combustion engine automobile. 10 times, right, once you buy it. Now, another one is that, well, this is your ICE vehicle parts. Your internal combustion engine automobile has more than 2,000 moving parts pistons and things that explode a million times every minute and so on and so forth. An EV has 20. 20. They don't even touch one another because they're electromagnetic. So maintenance in an EV is essentially nil, right? So let's say it's 10x cheaper uh, to maintain an EV than to uh, maintain an ICE vehicle. Another one is that electric vehicles last for 500,000 miles, 800,000 kilometers. Easy, right? Whereas an internal combustion engine automobile lasts 140,000, maybe 200,000, which means EVs last two and a half times longer. Now, individuals drive about 10,000 miles a year. Why would we want an EV with 500,000? I mean, who drives a car 500,000, I mean, 50 years? Right? So for individuals, this may not be a disruptive thing, but for fleets who drive 100,000 miles per year, that could be disruptive. And last, um, basically the, the, the powertrain, the EV powertrain, is far more powerful than the internal combustion engine automobile. Um, so if you look at, for instance, a group of university students in Switzerland, they built a car that beat the $1 million Porsche 918 Spider in acceleration. Students in university beat Porsche, right? Should I say that again? EVs are much more powerful than ICE vehicles. Now, if all you do is basically swap internal combustion engines for uh, electric vehicles, then this is what happens. Um, at the 16% cost curve, essentially, uh, this is my prediction from 2014. And I said that by this time, the market would offer um, 200 mile EVs, 200 mile being the minimum that you need to go mainstream um, at $40,000 today. How am I doing, right, for prediction? We have two and there are more coming. And by the end of this year, we should have several more in the $33,000, $35,000 range. And that's what a cost curve will give you, right? By 2020, the average, so the average American new car 
is $34,000. By 2020, an EV is going to be 20% cheaper to buy, 10x cheaper to maintain, more powerful, and 10x cheaper to fuel. What do you think the rational economic choice is going to be, right? To buy a $35,000 car with the performance of a Porsche or the Porsche, which is $100,000. This is basically purely economic choice. And that 16, 20% now, of course, because it's accelerated, is going to keep going down. So if it keeps going down in this direction, essentially it means by 2025, every new vehicle will be electric. Every bus, every truck, every van, by 2025 will be electric. Boom, right? That's where the disruption comes, right? That's it. Now, this assumes that we're gonna swap, like I said, our internal combustion engine automobiles with electric vehicles. And if that's what happens, then it's gonna take a while before we swap them all. But it, this is not the way it's gonna happen. Now, I don't need to tell you about Tesla, which has 450,000 uh, waiting lists who put up a thousand bucks each to just be on the waiting list, right? To buy their car. So that gives you an idea of the latent demand. And also uh, by raising $450 million from people directly, um, any bankers in the crowd, this was the largest crowdfunding event in history, right? They did not need a bank to do this, but that's another disruption. We can talk about that some other time. Now, as disruptive as EVs are, autonomous technology is even more disruptive. Why? Well, let me walk you through that. So, um, let me show you this video. Audio, please. Audio. Oh, you have it. Okay. So, this is, this is um, Waymo, formerly known as Google. Um, so, a couple of months ago, they actually launched their self-driving program in Phoenix. Level four self-driving cars in Phoenix today. This is not in the future. Some people say, oh, level four, 2030 or whatever. Today is happening in Phoenix. And Waymo said that they're gonna blanket all of Phoenix with this, which is autonomous, electric, on demand, by the end of this year. Blanket all of an American city with AEVs. Now, um, you can watch this online. There are more than 40 companies investing billions, tens of billions of dollars in autonomous technology. Now, why are they doing that? Well, because, oh, and Tesla says that they're gonna reach level five. Now, you know the difference between, le level four means no hands, but in a geographically constrained area. So Waymo can do it in Phoenix because it's sunny all the time, but that car may not work in Oslo, for instance, right? Level five means it works in Oslo, in Christchurch, New Zealand, in San Francisco, anywhere, right? Anywhere a human can drive, it can drive. So all we need is level four in a geo-constrained area when this disruption starts. Now, um, one more thing. A lot of companies say that, oh, we'll have level four ready by 2025, 2030, whatever, right? An autonomous vehicle is a computer on wheels. Computer on wheels, right? What does that mean? If you look at the history of computing, um, all you need is one operating system to work and we're off to the races. So Apple did not wait for Google before they released the iPhone, right? Um, Microsoft did not wait for Apple before they released their uh, Windows and so on. So all we need is one operating system to work and it's off to the races. And in the end, only two or three are gonna survive. That's what the history of computing says. Um, and it's a winner take all thing. Now, how long is that gonna take, right? And what about the cost of autonomous vehicles? Let me give you an idea of um, the price, right? So what's the technology cost curve of the key uh, technologies that you need to do level four and five autonomous vehicles? Now, 
This is what a car sees, uh, an autonomous car sees, when they use a necessary sensor called LiDAR. LiDAR emits a million pulses per second, 360 degrees, um, and basic a million pulses per second, and it generates a real-time view of the world, right? So in 2012, LiDAR was $70,000. So what did the experts say in 2012? Not gonna happen, right? Not in this lifetime. I mean, sensor is just twice the cost of a car. What did happen was this. Um, Silicon Valley company uh, basically launched a $1,000 LiDAR last year, $1,000. So it went from 70 grand to 1,000 within a few years. And that same company uh, released the $250 LiDAR this year. $250. So you have four or five, essentially for $1,000, you have the sensor that is necessary, plus radar and, and so on and so forth for autonomous vehicles. What about supercomputing? Well, you need supercomputing power to deal with all of this data. Um, so to give you an idea, this was the world's most powerful supercomputer in the year 2000. So it was, you know, the size of this room and one teraflops, trillion floating point operations, whatever that means, right? Um, for about $50 million. 50 million, one teraflops. This is the CEO of NVIDIA, Jensen Huang, showing last year the eight teraflops GPU in his hands, right? And this is what is needed to run a level four, according to them, autonomous vehicle. That's a 600,000 time improvement in 17 years. That's what technology does. But wait, there's more. Their latest is the Pegasus, 320 trillion operations per second, and that's coming out this year. And that is what you need to run level five autonomous vehicle and NVIDIA says that there are 25 companies attempting level five today, 25 companies. Remember, like a spouse, all you need is one, right? All you need is one. Um, and it's not about um, cars because it's an operating system. Essentially, you can run it on anything on wheels. You can run it on delivery vehicles, on cars, on trucks, on SUVs, on you know, wheelchairs. Uh, I'm sitting there on a wheelchair being built at an MIT lab that is self-driving. Self-driving wheelchair, check that out, right? How disruptive is that? So there are accelerators that may yet make autonomous technology happen faster. And so Waymo, Google, has done about three and a half million miles of real road driving in eight years, right? Which is not a whole lot, but within their computer system, they do 10 million miles a day, per day. And they can simulate things in the computer that they can't possibly simulate in real life. Throw an elephant on the road, yeah, they can do that, right? But not in real life. So what that does is accelerate the development of self-driving, uh, just like um, high definition 3D mapping. If you do a high definition mapping of a city, which would cost a couple of million dollars, essentially you can accelerate the development because this gives you an accuracy of one centimeter. One centimeter accuracy. Now, okay, so what if we have a car and we not drive and we go to school and we tweet and we Facebook and we do all of these nice things? So what, right? Where's the disruptive uh, opportunity? Here's what. So um, let me put it all together. But before I do that, I just want to throw one number. Cars are the middle class's second largest expenditure. Uh, after our house, essentially cars are the biggest capex, and yet we only use it 4% of the time. 4% asset utilization is a disruption waiting to happen, right? So let's put it all together. It's what I call transport as a service. Now, what does that mean? This is the convergence of two technologies, electric and autonomous, 
and the business model of ride hailing. So on demand, autonomous electric. Now, why not autonomous ice? Now that could be disruptive also. It could be, but what happens is this, because an EV lasts 500,000 miles, you can depreciate an EV over 500,000 miles in five years, but in that time, you would need two and a half internal combustion engine cars. Two and a half, right? Plus maintenance, plus gasoline and all that. What that means is that on a per mile basis, uh, essentially AEVs are gonna be at least two and a half times cheaper. So the ride hailing company who do AAIs won't be able to compete with AEVs. Now, again, TAS is on-demand, autonomous, electric, owned by fleets, not individuals, fleets. So the TAS disruption is a disruption of two things, the individual ownership model of transportation and also the gasoline vehicle. On day one, the day that autonomous technology is approved and ready, is approved by the regulators, the cost per mile of an AEV will be 10 times cheaper than buying a new car. 10 times. Every time we've had a 10X in history, a 10 time difference for a similar product or service in history, we've had a disruption every single time. So assume that level four autonomous vehicles are approved and ready by 2021. Essentially, we have a 10X. Somebody's gonna come up to buy a car and they're gonna think, do I spend 50,000 over the next five years or do I wanna spend maybe a thousand per year on demand? 10X in history has been a disruption. So we feed that into our computer system and what we get is that by 2030, 10 years later, 95% of all miles, now we did this with US data, will be autonomous, electric, and on demand. 95%. Now, it doesn't mean 95% of vehicles will be fleets. 60% will be fleets and 40% will be individually owned. But individually owned cars only contribute 10,000 miles a year. Fleets contribute 100,000 miles a year. So fleets are 95% of the miles. What does that mean? It's the end of two things, individual ownership of cars and the internal combustion engine automobile. The number of cars, the fleet, goes down by 80% because cars are running around 10 times longer instead of being parked 96% of the time. So the size of the fleet goes down by 80%, no more traffic. And autonomous vehicles, of course, have better throughput, they drive better than people, um, so they use space much better. Parking, gone, right? Um, congestion, gone. Oil industry peaks around 2020 at 100 million barrels per day, assuming level four autonomous vehicles are approved by 2021 and goes down by uh, 30 million barrels to 2030. Um, and Prices go down immediately because all you need in the oil industry, as you know, is a two, three million barrel oversupply uh, for prices to crash or to go up, right? So they go down to the equilibrium cost, which according to Reistat is $25. Um, so consequences. Parking. We have built cities for cars. A lot of our cities are 30 to 40% parking, right? 80, 90% of that, gone, vacant. So I did the numbers for, let me show you, Los Angeles. So in the vacant parking space in Los Angeles, you can fit three cities the size of San Francisco. Three whole cities, including parking in San Francisco. So a lot of our cities are gonna have to deal with this. I mean, what do we do with all that empty, vacant parking space, right? Do we want green space? Do we want more businesses? Do we want affordable housing? Because, you know, essentially it's gonna happen by 2030. And for the first time in a long time, in generations, we're going to have the opportunity 
to redesign our cities, right? Another thing that's gonna happen is that the average family is gonna save about 6,000 a year. 6,000 right to our pockets, right? For not owning a car and, you know, essentially doing uh, on-demand autonomous transportation. Um, social, basically we're gonna increase accessibility of transportation to everybody. For the first time in history, we're gonna have door-to-door, -door, cheap, convenient uh, transportation for everybody. Kids, elderly, disabled, the poor, the young, everybody, because it's gonna be 10 times cheaper. Um, of course, there's disruption of um, uh, mining and so on and so forth, and 90% less CO2 emissions. 90% less CO2 emissions. Now, this is an implication. It's not the cause. The disruption happens because of purely economic reason, but the side effect is 90% less CO2 emission. And I don't wanna go over the geopolitical implications, but for the first time in a long time, we'll have a chance to redesign our cities. Redesign our cities the way we want our cities to be for our kids, for our future. Um, so to wrap it up, back to the future. Um, essentially in 2018, we're on the cusp of the biggest, fastest, most consequential disruption of transportation in history. And as you see, the technology disruption framework shows that the tipping point is right around the corner. And when it tips, it's gonna happen very, very quickly. Thank you. And this is not an energy transition. This is a technology disruption, two very different things. It's not a linear transition, it's an S-curve disruption. Thank you.